Okay. Welcome. Good morning. This is Athena Starseed, and this is a series called Raising Reverence, and we are raising the vibrational frequency of the planet. And the show today is about red flags, rebalancing, and restoring a state of reverence. And I have an incredible guest, Letty Stiles, who is an evolutionary astrologer. She is a mystic. She's a healer. Uh, she's an art therapist. She's got a ton of amazing qualities, but before we bring her on, I just want to open up with some prayer for today. So just take a nice deep breath, inhale, and exhale. In the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men, let light return to earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men and women. May the Christ consciousness return to earth. In the center where the will of God is known, let the center guide the little wills of men, the center which the masters know and serve, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. May the plan of love, light, and power restore heaven on earth. Archangel Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael, Father Sky, Mother Earth, from the point of light that connects us all, please be here in the sacred circle of light. Allow Letty Stiles and Athena Starcy to be clear and pure channels for the evolution of all listening, all involved, and all of humanity. Amen and amen. Welcome, Letty Stiles. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm excited to join you with this beautiful topic. So I guess most people know who you are, but they don't know who I am. So I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about me. One of the things that I'm always very excited is to share some of the wisdom and knowledge I have acquired uh, through the years. So I started in my 20s wanting to be a therapist, and I ended up working at a rape hotline and um, nonprofit organizations that work with domestic violence, sexual abuse. And then I worked in the court for a while with, within those same type of things. So I knew that I was a counselor. I loved helping people, but I saw some amazing situations and, and professionals that were dealing with things that don't seem to change very much for women. So my path has always worked with women. Um, and then I, you know, I pursued my formal education to become a therapist, didn't quite make it. I went different direction with my shamanism. So I studied shamanism for a while and Tantra. So I spent about 10 years educating women and men around healthy sexuality. And now, after leaving corporate, uh, the corporate life for about 10 years, I've been dedicating myself as a hypnotherapist, a spiritual healer, an astrologer, and artist in helping women reach empowerment and finding their magic and deconditioning the patriarchy rules that keep us bound to old patterns that no longer work for women. And that's one of the things when I received your phone call, I recognized your story. I have heard it from so many women that talk about feeling disempowered, confused, and all the things that you went through. And, you know, after doing the counseling that I did with rape victims and sexual assault victims, I see that not much has changed. The Me Too movement has been very healthy, but I think it's because as women, we have to change our mindset, don't you think, Athena? Yeah, can you bring the camera down a little bit so I can see your full um, view? Your Oops. Yeah. Well, this is a little hard. There, go. there you go. Excellent. Now I can see a full perspective okay. of you. Okay, so you were saying it hasn't changed much. Go into that a little bit. Well, I think um, some things have changed, but the fundamental patriarchal uh, um, attitude towards women haven't changed very much. I think more than ever, look at all the porn and the objectification that is happening and that women participate in. And I'm not judging anybody, but it's simply a paradigm that we want to shift because it's still happening. You know, when I hear victims feeling so very much um, like they're to blame that they're looking from within themselves to find out what they did wrong, that's a conditioning. If we had a society where there was no shame to say this happened to me, and women would be supported, it'd be a completely different game, but it's still the same thing. The victim is always looking for what happened, what did she do? Instead of really focusing on what he did, right? Everybody focuses on what she did, what she wore, what she looked like, what she said. You know, all those things to me are still putting women in a very disempowering uh, position. 
and it's uh, conditioning from society. And when I mentioned the, the word patriarchy, I am not referring to, referring to gender, men or women, because I feel men have been as damaged as women and they continue to perpetuate this very uh, toxic dynamic that gets passed on as normal behavior. And some men think there's nothing wrong with uh, groping a woman, look at our president, or you know, do, doing disrespectful things around women, speaking badly about women, and heaven forbid if you stand up for yourself, what do they call you? A bitch, excuse my language. So women don't feel very inspired to stand up for themselves because they know that they're going to be questioned, their integrity, their heart. And at the same time that this is happening, the person's dealing with all the emotional impact of the trauma that they just experienced. And that's what I've worked with over and over. We cannot change society at once, but we can change ourselves and how we view ourselves and how we um, speak about each other as women and how we can begin to encourage each other to step into our power um, without competition. Women need to also lose that um, conditioning of the patriarchy. Some women, uh, we are acting that out because we were born in it. What do we know unless we begin to have awareness and we start growing spiritually? But even then, as a young child, any young child could see and understand what inequality is. Because I think equality and freedom of expression is a birthright. So a child knows when something is not right, when they're being touched in the wrong way. A woman does too, but she socialized to not speak up, to be quiet, because the price is too heavy for her to pay. It's going to be judgment, ridicule. She's not going to be believed. She's, her life is going to be put in, you know, on the stage. What person that has just gone through trauma wants to go through more trauma? Not many. I was one, and I know that I walked away from pressing charges because I knew what my life would be if I did that. And it was my choice, um, but it, who knows? It might have been different in a, if I was living in a more um, equalitarian society that values women and values human beings. It doesn't matter. Uh, when we abuse of each other, especially sexually, we, uh, it should be respect for every single being, a woman, a child, a gay man, whatever. Uh, that sexuality is a beautiful gift from God. It's a beautiful gift of co-creation with the universe. And it needs to be honored, not sold, not packaged, and not, certainly not turns against men and women and children. That is not sexuality. That is power wanting to feel powerful over other pers other people. When I worked in the rape uh, industry, not an industry, but the, in that support, what I learned, that is the culture. You know, we have that culture and women have learned to adjust. So even a powerful woman like you, Athena, or even, you know, women that step forward to accuse Trump of some of the wrongdoing, they're powerful, they're educated, they have money, and yet, they were reluctant to step forward. How sad is that? That even when a woman is very um, successful in the world, she's still conditioned to acquiesce, to be quiet, and not to say anything because the price for her is too high. And that's not the way it should be. It should be the man being accountable, getting counseling or therapy, or, you know, looking at the law, what the law is saying, according to what that person did. You know, we can't judge everybody by the same yardstick. And that's what's happened too in our prison system. But, you know, the people that are violating you, they have areas that they need to work on. It doesn't mean that I'm not for jail for people that really do a lot of harm, but also they don't get the education they need. They come back and they repeat the same thing. And, you know, not all sexual abuse is equal, but I'll tell you what it has in common, Athena. It leaves the person that was the recipient of the non-wanted touch uh, feeling guilty and shameful, 
and that there's something wrong with them. That is wrong. Th that's how I feel. Um, well, this is extremely educational for me, and um, I'm glad that I reached out to you. What is um, incredible about this interview is that I was judging the other women because I didn't want to believe it. And when I confronted Ellie Tan the first time, I reached out to you. I got counseling around it. I asked if you would be willing to work with some of these women to see if that, you know, if, the, if they needed counseling. He offered to pay for that. He did an apology video. You saw that whole thing move forward. And so then I was uh, shocked that it did happen to me. And I realized, and I want to go over this, you were talking about the red flags because the first two retreats, um, the first one, nothing. The second one, it was calling me pet names and starting to flirt with me. And, and then by the third one, it was a slow move in. And then I, I was confused because you admire the teacher. You admire you know, the partnership. You're doing a business with somebody. There's a lot at risk. It's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. Um, what is the proper protocol? I mean, I don't know if there's a protocol because I think everybody's going to react to what happens to them differently. But I know one thing is that in our society and as women, even in society uh, is not changing fast enough, we have to support other women. You see what has happened. We've been conditioned to be suspicious. Uh, women have been maligned, uh, discredited and all that. And I think even though we're not realizing that we're being conditioned because it's continually happening and it's happened over the years, uh, we, it's natural for you to feel, I can't trust this woman. Um, maybe she's exaggerating because like, once again, it's all over. This conditioning is all over our entertainment. It permeates our society, the society, you know, and the fabric. And as women, begin to feel empowered like they have, especially the, the Me Too movement, we're beginning to have a bigger awareness that we have to heal that part of us, uh, that we, uh, we allow to be conditioned because we didn't know any better. And when we know better, uh, we have to be as supportive to our girlfriends and the women around us because they're also deconditioning from never feeling like they have a voice. They have to be nice. They can't upset people. You have to take care of everybody. You know, the archetype of the, of the mother, you mother the whole world. And then if you are a professional woman, you, you know, you go out there in the competitive world and you go kick ass. That's exhausting. Uh, men don't have to do that. Men go out, they go earn the bacon, right? They come home and they relax. A woman comes home after work and she needs to cook dinner, do laundry, take care of the kids. I mean, it's not that men don't help uh, or that there's, you know, husbands that are very supportive and men that don't follow that paradigm. But if you look worldwide, men are still following that and women are still expected to be in this little box. And so the conditioning of being in shock the way you were and how you doubted those women but you still wanted to do something good for them. You still wanted his, you understood that they needed validation and acknowledgement. You understood that he could um, be gracious, admit his mistakes and help and help a woman begin to feel more trust that she could go heal this inappropriate situation. But he did that in a very insincere way because what was he doing in the meantime? He was just uttering the words and then his behavior never changed. And unfortunately, here's the first red flag that many people miss. And that is when someone adores us and loves us and really starts to uh, make us feel like, we're, you know, we have this special friendship and they violate, you know, some norm that doesn't feel good to you and you let it slide. It's like a burglar that knows, ah, there's the weakness into this house. This is how I'm going to enter. And I don't think it's all calculated. It's subconscious. But these uh, type of individuals, they just chisel away. And then when they have you feeling that you can trust them, they begin the process that you so well described yesterday in your interview. They start to put you down. They start to criticize you in between compliments. Uh, 
they start undermining you when you don't see them. Uh, it's very insidious and covert. And so you don't see it. Because if you feel I can trust this person, you're not, sometimes we don't listen to our um, intuition. You know, we, we're not taught to listen to our intuition. Um, most women do because it's so strong in some women. But we, we begin to doubt ourselves, right? And to um, let that slide. And when that person sees that you have boundary issues, it's like he knows I can manipulate, I can overpower, I can con, I can scam. Because they know that boundary is not, you know, very um, strong. And so that's the number one flag that you have to have a boundary and not only have a boundary, but to say, wait, that wasn't right. That didn't feel well. Uh, you need to leave my house, which you did, or have a conversation depending on the inappropriate behavior of the man. I always believed a man, if a man acted out in a gathering that I used to do called Tantra Pujas gatherings, I would put him aside. I would talk to him. I wouldn't shame him. I would maybe tell him to leave, but I would always try to educate and help him understand how his behavior is disruptive, disrespectful, and harmful to a woman. And I've strived that for many years to teach that to men and women, because women, we also need to get um, educated on a lot of things around being able to stand up for our sexuality and not, um, you know, doing what we were taught by our grandmothers to use our sexuality, you know, to manipulate. And so both men and women, I believe, have a lot to learn. But the red flag is having no boundaries. Right. The sec uh, the okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you could um, put, sometimes you're talking and your chin's going down off the screen. Oh, okay. So just make Sorry. sure that your head is in the center so that I can see you when you're, your mouth when you're talking. Okay. Can you see okay. yourself? Yeah, I can see myself. Okay, okay so sorry. I just give a little tiny bit more on the. Um, I have to, I have to sit up straight, Athena. Okay, remove the camera okay. down so I can see you. I want to make sure that I can see your mouth. <laughs> okay, and, and then we don't trust our intuition. That's the second one. You know, in your heart, you have that radar. We are born with that radar that this is not right, and we ignore it. And they know it because, like you, we're compromised. Sometimes we, you know, there's sexual harassment in the office. You're scared to bring it up because the powers that be may not be very receptive. The process of investigating sexual uh, harassment at work is really not that comfortable for people that are going through that. It's a traumatic event, okay? And to go through more questioning of your, um, your own truth is very hard for a woman. You know, so I think the minute that you see that that person is violating even a small uh, rule that you have, you need to say, no, stop that. That's not appropriate. Leave my house. And the other thing that I realize uh, with my clients and with many women is that we don't have the words. We don't know how to say it because it hasn't been modeled. It's been modeled of, yes, of course, I don't want, I don't want to rock the boat. I, don't, I want them to like me. I don't want to be judged. We have all these internal uh, excuses because we don't feel safe, right? If we felt safe and there was a system where you were not going to be treated like you're the criminal uh, or the perpetrator, women would come forth. But that's the thing. Um, what I find is when someone hasn't been able to um, exercise the expression of their unique voice and something happens to them, they, they don't have the words. They either feel I'm going to be harsh and I'm going to be angry and that scares me, or I'm just going to be quiet and take it, or I'm just going to talk about it to people that will understand me and won't judge me, or I'll just keep it to myself. The reason why we don't have the language, we don't know how to speak in a conscious manner that doesn't betray how I feel so that you could like me. And so that's one of the areas that I'm working on, conscious communication. So women and other people and, other, and men too, that don't know how to say something that they perceive as aggressive or mean or they're angry because some people fear those emotions. 
Right. There is a healthy way to communicate that where you're honoring yourself and you're honoring that person, yet you're saying, buddy, this wasn't okay. We need to talk about it. Or you need to stop that immediately. Well, and you so, need to- well, okay, so I want to jump in here for a second. Um, mm-hmm. I felt during part of that, uh, you know, third retreat, I did say, this isn't okay. Um, I'm putting you in charge and authority of a sacred space. And I'm asking you to honor my boundaries and not let this other person come back in that has already violated um, right. my trust and my, um, my comfortability sexually. And I had a verbal agreement that they would not be invited back because when I leave my home, I have to go to work for four or five hours and he's in charge until I get back and then we co-teach. So he yesed me to death got my trust. And then I, by the time I got back, there she is sitting in my living room. So as that kept happening, um, the trust started eroding, but my anger started increasing. And I didn't have the languaging to say, what are the consequences for continuing to break agreements? And so uh, that was really challenging for me. The other thing is, Mm -hmm. I want to say that um, even when I uh, told people about it. And I put the first video up, you know, two men in my life that were really close to me said, take it down. You shouldn't say anything. And then my mother and my sister said, no, you need to put it up because this could happen to somebody else. And so even men that loved me wanted me to be quiet. And so I got very confused, like, wow, you're saying, even if it's wrong, and even if it's true, you still don't want anybody to say what happened. And so then I got really confused. So speak to that. Well, of course, think about it. Uh, They're conditioned that they're protecting you because they know the system is not that friendly. The women that speak up, they're judged, they're called names, they're, look at what the media does to some women that do, look at the disrespect from that point of view, from the collective. And so loved ones don't want to see you have those consequences even if it's that because we know that the society has this way of perceiving women right we still don't have the equal rights there's still bad attitude and so it it creates this self-doubt and i'm not safe and i'm not supported how can i go out there and um you know it's like david uh and goliath you know and takes a lot of character. So I'm going to tell you my reaction, which I don't think I've ever shared with you. Okay. Uh, when I saw your video and you sent it to me, which was, I think the f- very early on, it was one of the first people to see it. I went, Whoa, this woman has so much courage. I was blown away that, and I could tell in the video that you were still in shock. And that's why I called you. I just thought, Wow, even though she's gone through so much and is still going through that, she she still has this heart that she wants to educate and she wants to bring love to a situation that most women would behave like judging him, putting him down, all the the stuff that's typical between men and women. You didn't do that. I thought that was very courageous. And there was part of me going, yikes, it's out there. What's going to happen? But, you know, I was willing to support you because I know that part of your mission is to bring more love and empowerment and understanding to men and women. So that's why I called you. I saw you in shock. And then we talked a couple of days later and I saw how quickly you processed because you had people to turn to. You had people that you can call and they set you straight, Right. Yeah. Some, women don't, some women don't have that. So I'm hoping that any woman that's watching that know that there is women around you that will support you, that will stand up for you, that will, you know, even if they don't like you, they still will support you. I see that more and more, that women are becoming more supportive of other women because we are beginning to understand that it's not men, it's the system that has created uh these attitudes that we've adopted the men in our lives have adopted and we're in the process of healing and reversing and i'm very hopeful for that so when you your video came out i i'm going to really tell you i said oh my god she has balls (laughs) 
look at even me thinking that's masculine that's saying oh she's like a man but you have you it takes courage and strength to do that and you don't care what the consequences were not at that point you cared maybe maybe, maybe i use my ovaries <laughs> that woman has big ovaries but i but i think one of the most beautiful things that you did is you put it out there so other women can say this has happened to me too and we're not celebrities okay we're just normal people uh so the me too movement still goes on whether you're a celebrity or you're a housewife in encino uh and women are beginning to change and i think it's very important for any woman to have a woman's circle because your sisters will always hold you up and in those women's circles consciousness and awareness is brought in and we become excuse me <coughs> when women join together we all carry the womb of creation within us okay and we can create miracles as women because we're co-creators of the universe we contain that within our bodies so when women come with intention and awareness to help each other things happen excuse me you know i think it's really important to, to comment on that because we're talking about what are the red flags and you're saying that they gain your trust you gain my trust with a lot of compliments um a lot of adoration um a lot of false promises a lot of agreements he agreed with everything that i said um and then he you said the compliment and then the criticism so then he started to erode the criticism mm -hmm. and so then he broke my trust and so um by the time uh, I found out that he was disempowering me by talking behind my back to our clients and I was losing rapport with the students, um, at that point I was really like, I, I just didn't know what to do. So then I was so weak and I had such low self-esteem to next to him that he knew that I wouldn't say anything in front of anybody. So, um, you know, red flag number three is like he knew he had me where it would right. be embarrassing because nobody would have believed me because he had already taken uh, the flow and the rapport back to himself. And that's very common, Athena. Uh, you, you could look at many movies and programs and the woman slowly gets discredited. Uh, yeah, the, the feedback from your students is we don't like you because you don't know what he was doing behind the scenes. And then when you became aware, you were trying to do a workaround because the consequences were financial and you're a single mom. Uh, you have students and to do something that would disrupt uh, a program that they paid for and have been dedicated to, it would affect your reputation. You care that their experience would have changed he knew all that and this is why during that period is when he decided to act out because see he knew you your boundaries are weak uh you're, you're not trusting your intuition and now i got her where i have her now i could do and say how i really feel and she just has to sit there and take it that's the same thing that a man that batters a woman does okay same thing because what happens to a woman that starts to lose her confidence? She doesn't listen to her, her um, uh, intuition, is in a financial situation that's dependent. It begins to erode her, her power. And every time she's hit or there's violence towards her, she no longer has the inner resources or strength or the outer resources because people are going to step away from you, right? Uh, right. They don't know what to do. And so then you're alone and you're not willing to take the step. And that's how it happens in a very insidious and covert way. Once they have you compromised because you need the money, uh, you care about your project or whatever, he doesn't care. He only cared about glorifying himself and saying he was this and he was saying he was that. And maybe he's all that, but like a lot of spiritual teachers that I've seen along the way, you know the gurus the big teachers they all have faltered because they get so inflated that they think that they're beyond other people and yet they still have their shadow work to do this man has a lot of shadow work to do and he's so arrogant he doesn't see it i mean i'm sure you and the other ladies are not the first ladies that have 
dealt with his um, BS. He brought his BS before he was spiritual. And it's, it's, it's a pattern that he carries with himself and not to judge him, but he's not, society is letting him get away with it. So he doesn't have to change. All he has to change is his con depending on the group of women he's with. And, you know, the other thing is a spiritual community because women are love and light and they want to be open and they're, they're much more trusting. Those type of individuals come into the spiritual community and they know that there's weakness because we are trying to lose that harsh edge of society. And I've seen this over and over and over. One day I'll tell you about the man that came to my house. Um, later on, we found out he was a serial killer. Oh my God. Wow. Yep. And we knew, and we did not allow him. We defended the woman that, I mean, it's a long story, but what I learned is that I 100% trust my intuition. It was right. The women that I worked with, with this situation, which is a long story, we trusted our intuition. And the reason that woman is still alive is because we interfered. Uh, she, she was part of our group. And we said, oh, no, we're going to come and help you and get you out of the situation. And a year later, after all the doors closed because this woman was protected, he left, went to Las Vegas, and within a week, he killed a person. And so later on, we found out that he was a serial killer. And that just blew our, it just blew us away because this happened in community, but we listened very much to our intuition. We got the men involved and we, we helped her. Okay. She went back with him, but he knew that there was too many eyes on him to do anything. And to me, women, please make sure that you have a circle of women and sisters. Don't stay isolated because it's so important to have that support because, you know, there's lovely women like Athena and a beautiful goddess circles, right? All yeah. over. Right. And exactly. They, exactly. They, and I think that's, that's important because you're one of the women that I've gone to your circles in your home for over 15 years. And um, you have always surrounded yourself with powerful, spiritual women. Right. And I also learned that as a spiritual community, because we're loving and open and accepting, it's a perfect ground for those con men to come in or men that know they want to get away with stuff. Because it seems like in the spiritual community, we'll go, let's process it or whatever, rather than calling the police. Right. So um, women are always been the target, regardless of the environment. I've seen it in corporate settings. I've seen it in, you know, relationships of people that love each other. So this attitude that I feel permeates our society of disempowering women, not uh, discrediting women, never, never, the land. This all parents and women are all even our women terms, and that with a woman or, or what with your sexual. But I think as people, we have to realize that the abuse is we have to take responsibility for it, right? Like you wanted him to take responsibility. Right. He, 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 and also, he still hasn't. He's basically saying that I'm not speaking the truth. And so, you know, that's fine because I'm not here to convince him or anybody. I just feel that um, putting more education around it and realizing that I got disempowered. And when he started saying things like, you know, if you're emotional, you're not spiritual. <laughs> if, if, if you, uh, if you can't just like let everybody take advantage of you, then you're not seeing the higher point of view, you know? So he was trying to hit me in my spirituality to discredit my gut instinct and my intuition and then violated the boundaries until he had me where I, you know, felt like I didn't have a choice until I had had it. And then when everything was over, it, you know, it just took me an hour. Okay. I'm texting you, please date your things and get out. And I had two men there. 
um, one from the retreat and um, I had another man there while he came back to get his mm -hmm. stuff. So I felt safe. Right. And again, your situation was a little different, but look at what you did. You, you actually got to the point where your internal cyst kicked in and said, that's enough. And that's wonderful. That's healthy. I'm going to tell you that some women lose that radar because they're disempowered so much in their lives or they don't have support or women that would feed back to them. Hey, that's not right. Let's talk about it. What can you do? Look at all the support you got from women and that even when you put this out on the internet, I saw that 80% of the people, if not more supported you. I didn't know about the two men that said, take it out, but I understand why. Because as men, they know how messed up uh, our system is and the mindset that we have as society. Men know that women have, you know, a hurdle to climb, which is wrong because if a woman is victimized or perpetrated against her will, there shouldn't be any shame for that, right? She shouldn't be asking herself, what did I do wrong? It's our, the attention gets diverted to the wrong person. It needs to be put on Elliot Tom. Why did you do this? What was going on with you? What makes you think that violating uh, women in this way is okay, let alone the, the other behavior, right? If you had gone to the police, uh, they would have done their job. But I tell you, it would be heavily questioning you what you did, you know, because he lived in your house, you know, all this stuff. Uh, the police departments have gotten better. But no, I've, I've been there too many times to see that even though they have protocols, they're still prejudiced. And again, this is not to judge people. This is simply to point out it is the conditioning of the patriarchal system that needs to go down, that is going down. And as astrologer, we talked about how this is changing and how it's going to be a while. But this system is done. Uh, a new system is coming in that is good, hopefully going to be more inclusive, uh, is going to be more caring and more balanced, where both the feminine and the masculine aspects are honored, rather than what happened, because we talked about the repression of sexuality, right? And how we brought up, we have brought up to repress our sexual desires, and then it gets perverted, and then men go act it out not that women don't but women do act it out as well with the men because they've been conditioned you know i've also worked with men that have been abused and they go through the same process and sometimes it's even harder for them because they've always been seen as the perpetrators so their shame is different than women but they also go through this when they've been sexually abused so I see both men and women suffering, and it's not what we're doing to each other. It's why we're doing it to each other, and that's the conditioning that's very persuasive, per, not persuasive, prevalent in our society. It's conditioned within us. Now, this doesn't mean it's to excuse people's um, actions. Every single person is a um, free, uh, sovereign being, and in that, freedom you have responsibility for your actions and what you co-create and you know remember we talked about the one of the questions you asked me that you said how did i create it yes i i remember saying that how did i because i believe i create my own reality and this is an opportunity for me to heal and actually feel and also say my truth because it's happened before i've never said anything people know me i'm not i, I mean i really don't want to pull this stuff out it's uncomfortable I know. <clears throat> so I do believe we create our own reality and we draw to, each, to, each, to, our, to us the lessons we need to learn. But also, um, you responded in the conditioned way. Yes, maybe you needed to have this experience uh, because you've now put it into a context and you've integrated and you immediately saw the value because you've been working with people as a coach. You have a lot of experience as well. And other women may not have that understanding so quickly. It may take them weeks. It may take them months or years to get to that conclusion. But the reason why I wanted to address that you created this, you did not create the attack. 
you did not create that. You responded to that human being in a way, in, in, in a way that you're conditioned to do it. And that's how you created your experience. You acted within your conditioning, the way society has conditioned us. And we can't run away from that. We all have been conditioned by, by society. It's just not something that we can uh, deny. We can, as a hypnotherapist, I work with people at, um, at deconditioning and letting go of old patterns that no longer work, that never worked, or that are very ancestral in nature. So we don't have to carry that. But I think it's important to understand is that our mindset does uh, bring in that vibration frequency that we do attract people that are vibrating at the same frequency with us. And also karmically, you know, we bring people in into our lives. Uh, when I say we don't always create our reality 100% as we co-create it, uh, it, you know. And I think part of it is you're using this opportunity beautifully to bring education and empowerment and information to both men and women. So look at the co-creation that you did from that. Do you see how you co-created, you responded to a situation that happened to you? And that's how we co-create in reality. We, the most important co-creation is how we interact with other people. And Ilya Tom, I saw some of your videos. I didn't see the red flags. I did see some of the ego, but that's normal. He talked a good game. He looked really legitimate. The fact that he made you safe by saying, I am celibate, was the con. That was the con. I'm celibate. <laughs> uh, right. So that, that, I think that is the main um, uh, challenge for women is that as a spiritual woman, when you hear I'm celibate, you immediately feel you can relax and put your guard down. And then if you question it, they're like, oh, you're overreacting. I was just being playful and friendly. Or you're, or you're projecting your desires onto me. That was the big red flag, okay? That was how he got in and created trust so quickly, okay? So I'm going to tell you something. When somebody tells you that they are, um, I run across this a lot in the spiritual circles of meditation and yoga and tantra. Just because the teacher is celibate doesn't mean there's no sexual energy running through their bodies, okay? Or they don't have karma to heal in that area. Uh, that's when you need to be even more alert because we discussed this, uh, you and I, that when you repress sexual energy, like priests and all these uh, celibate monks throughout the centuries, what happens to that? It becomes perverted because sexual energy is so powerful. Now, remember, this sexual energy creates life. It is the most powerful force in the universe, right? And if we suppress it, do you think that we can keep it in a little box and meditate it away? No, our bodies are constructed to have sexual energy. It's part of our vital force. Yes, you can meditate and channel it a different way, but the priests, the monks, all these men that are gurus, that are celibate, uh, yes, some of them are benefiting from that celibacy, but it comes from the repression of our sexuality, which we go back to the patriarchy system that if we allow people to be free with their sexuality, we cannot control them. We cannot guilt them. Think about how sex uh, is constructed as a um, matrix in our society to keep us enslaved and disempowered. So I believe that when, someone, when a guru is celibate, it doesn't mean they don't have sexual urges. It's whether they're successful at repressing it. And anytime you're repressing something like that, it's going to come out in a perverted way. Look at all these Catholic priests. And the, you know, the Catholic Church has hidden it because it knows the truth. The truth is none of these priests should be celibate. None of this would have happened all this century of uh, abusing children, abusing nuns and having sex with them as sex slaves would have never happened if the religion of Catholics would allow priests to be married and have a normal, you know, life uh, with husband. You know, why, why can't you be spiritual, dedicate your life to God, still be married and be a normal human being? 
Do you know what I mean? So to me, when someone says they're celibate, I'm going to be kind of looking to make sure that the behavior matches what they're saying to me. Because this is how he came in. I heard the lady that you had on yesterday. Right. And how, how shocking it was for her. Because I guarantee you, if she knew that he was not celibate, that he was still sexual, she would have been more inclined to be more careful about going to his room or maybe not, right? But she felt, I can trust this man. I can go up with him and I can go to his room and I'm going to be safe. And that wasn't the truth. That was his con. That was his biggest con. And then the other con was putting himself very high. You know, he's a high teacher. I've achieved this. I have achieved that. This is what I've learned about masters. Masters never go around advertising their enlightenment or their realization or their connection with God. They don't need to because they are surpassing the ego. He still had a lot of ego and he wanted a lot of recognition. And he wanted that recognition from you. So I believe the reason why he did what he did is he wanted to send a message that I, I'm more powerful than you. It had nothing to do with sex, Athena. We discussed this. A man that wants to get in your bed does not do that. They, romance, they do romance. They, they, they do it differently. This was never about sexuality and sexual assault and sexual abuse is never about sexuality. It has to do with power. It has to do with finding that power outside of you that you don't have. People that are doing this feel disempowered and let me get power over her. And then I will feel that I'm stronger or whatever it is, his motivation. But sexual attacks and abuse is never about sexuality. It's about power and control. So the reason the sexuality seems to be a big issue is because this is where we are the most controlled in our society is through our sexuality. Right. That... Um... That makes a lot of sense because um, if I go to the core wound, it was disempowerment. Um, I, uh, I, I did feel like I, I questioned my own validity. I was questioning my own, um, you know, teaching abilities after teaching, you know, I'm a seasoned teacher. I mean, for like 25 years, I've been mm -hmm. teaching since I was like 18 and 19. Group classes, boot camps, aerobics, retreats. And what didn't line up with me was when he was, complaining about my teaching, although hitting on me at the same time. Um, I was like, this is interesting. I go to work. I have great rapport with my, my clients. I do my own retreats. I have no problem with the students following the boundaries, the regulations, the verbal commitments. And I come back and every time I set something up, you'll erode it and then make me like I'm crazy. So there was a little bit of a crazy making going on. Which well, well, yeah. So let's, let's talk about that because that's called cognitive dissonance. Okay. Cognitive dissonance and what that is is confusing your brain okay so that you uh can be controlled it's like you're nice but then you're mean you know at the same time okay y your brain is conf getting confused you being it's planted seed and this is how you break someone down over the years this is what people do that do mind control it's called cognitive dissonance and this is when there's uh, two energies that are different sent into your system at the same time to confuse you. So it creates that confusion. It creates that self-doubt. You don't know where it's coming from. You begin to question whether it's you or them. Who is it? It also creates paranoia. Okay? And then what happens, you respond according to when you're feeling confused, Athena, you want to gain control, okay? And so you try to remind people these are the rules. I've asked you this. I've asked you that. All of a sudden, instead of him being supportive in your background, he's disempowering you. He's, he's taking that opportunity. It's like a parent, when, that, when your child goes to the other house, that parent undermines all the rules uh, from mom's house. Right, and then the child is always trying to reconcile the differences, the cognitive dissonance, 
and then the child acts out that confusion. And you know, when children, children go through the same thing. That is mind control technique is cognitive dissonance. When you're putting in two contrary energies, it confuses the brain. You begin to feel like, is it me? I don't know. You begin to question the most simple, moralistic uh, understanding that if you were not confused, you would immediately say, no, that's not right. But when you're not sure, you don't want to speak harshly or be out of turn, especially if he's making people go against you behind your back. You come back and you're going, wow, am I losing it? What's happening? Why are they acting this way? Well, Why I mean, are they that, that, that was, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was some of the things that were happening. He would say to me, okay, we're going to change the time. And then we'll all go to the beach at a different time. And then I would say, everybody, we're changing the time. Then the people would come back and they would be like, I'm just going to go anyway. And I'm like, well, I think we're all going at this time. And they're like, no, we ordered our Uber. And then I found yeah. out he's in the Uber leaving with them. Didn't tell me that he changed the time. And now I'm like the other teacher. I don't have any information and everybody's leaving. So it looks like I don't know what's happening or have right. agreed to go for a walk. And then as soon as I said, we're all going to go for a walk, people say, well, I don't know if I want to go. And he goes, okay, well, I'm not going to go. And I was like, I thought we agreed to go. And then he goes, if you want to go with her, go with her, not stay with me. And then undermines me after he said we were all going to go. So those kind of things were like tripping me out. I was like, right. Because look, look at this. This is like a, a family, isn't it? Right. It's, yeah. Think yeah. about the, the, the dynamic, the, the dad undermining the mom, the secrets. My God, as you talk about this, I see this in families. We do this, you know, we, we, uh, the dad is undermining the mother. The mother doesn't know what's going on. She feels out of control. In the meantime, he's like, don't listen to her. She's crazy. Uh, you know, blah, la la la. And the kids go along with the dad because the dad is being perceived as the authority that they want to please. And that's exactly how he set it up. While you're at work, he's there chiseling away at undermining you, at making you look bad. And then you come in, he's doing the cognitive dissonance, and you're confused and you don't know which way is up. And then you're very aware that these people are responding the, a certain way and you don't know why because you don't know the half the other half of the story of what he's doing while you're gone which was intentional to discredit you to undermine you and to have them judge you and have a different of opinion of you so then you come back and they're not receptive they're not respecting you this is exactly what happens in family dynamics well this, and, you this, know, makes, this makes sense because by the time he did the sexual assault nobody would believe me. That's right. And That's he what happened. It. It, was, it was a progression until the assault. And then he knew he'd already discredited me so that he could do whatever he wanted. And him doing what he did in the bedroom to you was not about sex. It was about, I have power over you, bitch. Excuse my language. But that was the statement. It was a retaliation towards you. That was not sexy. That wasn't hard opening that is not doesn't even turn anyone on when someone acts like that so so that is not and he knew it he knew you don't have sexual uh, attraction towards him so this was never about sex this is about overpowering you and giving you a message in retaliation and doesn't that sound like the age-old story of what women go through when they are strong smart and they threaten a man or what a man thinks is his power. And that's where I mean that the system is rigged because men are conditioned to have these beliefs and ideas and we perpetuate it generation after generation. I think it's going to change and it is changing. To me, when I look at the astrology, we're, moving, we're going to be moving towards more of the divine feminine coming in to balance things out. I hate to say this, 2,000 years of domination, control, and power by a patriarchal society is no longer working. So we all know it. We all see it. And we also have seen the rise of the feminine. This decade is going to be about the feminine. It's going to be, unfortunately, we're going to have to be humbled in some way 
to understand that we have to change our ways. And once again, I want to repeat this. This has nothing to do with gender. This has to do with a system that is no longer sustainable at no level. You could look at every level of our society. And also when you look at women, women are the most important building block of a society. And when women are not supported, it's not good for the society. And you could just look at where our society is, where our kids are. And I think as we raise together as women and we support each other and like what you're doing right now, educating women, um, being really brave and vulnerable to bring your life where people can listen to this 20 years from now, okay? Imagine that. We're, we're creating a record that uh, is like a book that one day someone can look back. But you're contributing at a really high level, Athena. I love you so much because you have the courage of a warrior. And right now we have Chiron, the planet of the wounded healer in Aries, which is about having the courage to become a spiritual warrior. And it's not about fighting. It's about standing for what is truly beautiful and what we can heal within us so that we could be better. So Chiron and Aries is going to be, is part of the U.S. chart. So there's going to be a lot of healing around these topics of the woundedness that we have in society. And I want to thank you so much, Athena, for having the courage to display your life uh, in front of everybody. Because uh, I'm sure that there might be people that criticize you or judge you or haven't had a positive response. I don't know if that's happened. You have not cared because what's leading you is your mission and i know your mission because i've seen your chart and we've talked about it so i love that you are an example of a woman uh, that's not apologizing for having a voice and you're not apologizing for having a heart because i hear your compassion as well do you know that which is amazing to me that you have compassion for this man that you have hope that he's redeemable and all human beings i believe have that capacity we have a way to turn around what we've done if we take responsibility and are willing to be humble to learn things differently uh, unfortunately sometimes it's harder for some men than for others i don't know him very well i don't know his path but i admire that you still have the compassion uh that you want to see him heal so that he's not contributing and spreading this toxicity male toxicity to our other sisters and i think that's just amazing that you're doing that i want to thank you i think it's important because you know you're a very strong woman you have an amazing voice but also you're very soft and you also have a need to be loved and have compassion to what happened to you you know so i have compassion for what your um process has brought you and how quickly you've been able to heal it and integrate it that that speaks to your inner work you've been doing and i see more and more women in this position and it makes me so happy to see women especially the younger women the, the women that are in the 30s they don't buy into what we bought into they're stronger i see their warriorness in them you know, and um, I love working with millennials because they are so clear of, about they don't have time for all this. They, they have a mission in this world. And you know what? Our world needs us. We don't need to be embroiled in this age old drama. Men and women need to evolve to a different level. And uh, anyway, that's my, my story. Okay, well, that is amazing. And I, I, um, I picked a tarot card um, and I wanted to share it because, you know, I do readings. I'm actually at work right now. I'm, I'm, you know, I got to run in a second. But um, what was important for me was to uh, continue my healing and realize that source is intelligent. The universe is user friendly. It's constantly helping me to, like you said, use this as fertilizer to evolve. I chose a card today. This is what it looks like. Oh my yeah. God, that's beautiful. See the owl? This is um, a deck. This is Alana Fairchild's deck. 
and it's um, the Earth Warrior. So it's interesting, you said warrior today, and that was in the deck. And this says, um, Uluka Vahini, she who rides the owl brings justice. She who rides the owl brings justice. Wow. She who rides the owl brings justice. And I just wanted to read a tiny little bit of this because I was like, Whoa. yeah, this is like so powerful for women. And, you know, so it says, um, I am the goddess of karma, wealth, and balance. I come to correct adharma, that which is dark, unnatural, and against nature and life, love, and all goodness. Um, I direct and redirect the misuse of wealth and power. <laughs> I, it's everything you said. I enact the divine justice and I restore divine order. Trust in the innocence of your own soul and fear not, for I am ever watchful and my power will bring the truth to the light. Divine justice is always brought here to bear. You do not have to worry about making the justice yourself or the universe will bring divine justice on its own. Wow, so, that, is, that is an amazing card. That really is. That, that's perfect, Athena. Wow, that just blew me away. That is so amazing. So, this uh, is justice. What you're doing is bringing social justice to a situation. That's what we're doing here is doing that. Because as women educate other women and, they're, and, we, and we are modeling that it's okay to be where we're at. There's no shame. There's only opportunity to heal, to correct, the inequalities of dominance and control, which has been what has happened to us for thousands and thousands of years. And men too. So I love men and I think men and women, we have a lot, a lot of work to do, but I'm very hopeful because I see more and more Athena's all over the place and I want to support you and, and anybody else. And I also want to invite them to reach out to me. Are you going to put information down below? I, I am. I'm going to put a link. Um, I'm going to put a link down below with your information so that any woman um, that has had any trauma around sexual assault or a power play or any actually issues in any regard, even a soul reading where you do their evolutionary astrology, looking at their South node, their karma that they came with, in with their north node what they're here to do to help the people evolve because we're in a transition and i do right. want to say a brief note that um because this teacher ellie tom alameen is at the forefront of the breatharian movement i do want to say it's not about breatharianism i am still a breatharian i'm still doing my process i am fasting i'm intermittent fasting i'm still teaching breatharian retreats i am not slowing down in any way shape or form and i just want people to know that we don't want to link his behavior with breatharianism so i want to separate those two he's a human being being human he has his own shadow work to do and those people who have listened to his teachings please continue to evolve yourself and do your own research and my big takeaway is not to give my power away right and also when you encounter a teacher like him take advantage of the message uh, that's not him. I, I, you know, gurus are going out. Uh, listen, to me. his message may st is still good. He's just a human being that does not have the superpowers he thinks he has. So don't throw away good, the good information, right, that, that you've all learned from him, because I think um, it's important. It's just that he's gone astray, because I think any new system that you're trying, I mean, breathing and having no food, it's a reconditioning of your brain. So it's even a deeper conditioning. Look at what you're doing. You're deconditioning what keeps you stuck uh, as a breatharian. If, you're, if the whole reason to become a breatharian is to be a sovereign being, right? And, and live uh, by natural law, you know, you're going to have to do with deconditioning a lot of stuff that doesn't go along with, uh, with eating food. You know what I'm saying? So anybody that's in that path, uh, you are revolutionizing yourself. And of course, you're going to have to look at these issues. You're going to have to look at the shadow. You cannot have enlightenment without doing the shadow work. It's impossible. It just doesn't work. 
Anyway, Athena, thank you so much. And I hope that every woman and man that's listening to this, that you understand we're coming from our heart, our desire to uh, help you become a better person, uh, to drop the shame, to heal yourself, because we need your gifts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Letty Styles. I I love you. I adore you. Every I love you too. Is every single one of us is like is like every single one of us is a candle of light, and that we want to be the lighthouses and the illuminaries of this golden age because it's all changing. And the more we can forgive ourselves and empower ourselves, we can stand in our soul power and we can give our gifts to the world. And that, in and of itself, just like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see, and the world gets brighter. So thank you so much. Her links okay. are going to be below, and um, we will talk with you again. I love you, and uh, blessings and light, everyone. Same here. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, and stay tuned. Blessings. Blessings.